combat experience um, in a number of the unfortunate wars that this country has been involved in. And given the degree of experience he's got, whenever he encounters or hears of the presence of an extremist, he will always reach for his pistol, which is normally, I think, on his belt or his shoulder holster. I, um, whenever I'm surrounded by lawyers, I always reach immediately for my credit card. <laughs> exactly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak in English. Um, obviously, I could have spoken in Hebrew, but I will speak in English. Um, and any, any as, as those of you who know English people, um, any Englishman abroad, if he can't be understood, he believes the best thing to do is to shout louder. So please raise your hand, and if I can't understand, I'll just shout a bit louder. Um, I'm going to give you my thoughts this afternoon on the practicalities and the challenges and difficulties faced by military forces in trying to fight within the provisions of international law against an enemy that deliberately and consistently flouts that law. I'll focus on counterinsurgency operations from the British and to some extent the American perspective, drawing on recent British experience generally and also on my own personal experiences of operating in this kind of environment. Soldiers from all Western armies, including of course Israel's and Britain's, are educated in the laws of war. Commanders are educated to a higher level so that they can enforce the laws among their men and take them into account during their planning. Because the battlefield, in any kind of war, is a place of confusion and chaos, of fast-moving action, the complexities of the laws of war, as they apply to kinetic military operations, are distilled down into rules of engagement, as we call them. In the British forces, rules of engagement normally regulate military action to ensure that it remains well within the international laws of war, giving an additional safety cushion to soldiers against the possibility of war crimes prosecution. In the most basic form, these rules tell you when you can and when you cannot open fire. In conventional military operations between states, the combat is normally simpler and doesn't require complex and restrictive rules of engagement. Your side wears one type of uniform, the enemy wears another. When you see the enemy's uniform, you open fire. Of course, there are complexities. The fog of war, sometimes literally fog, but always fog in the sense of chaos and confusion, means that mistakes are made. You confuse your own men for the enemy. The tragedies that have ensued from such chaos and misunderstanding a legion throughout the history of war. We call it blue on blue, friendly fire or fratricide. There are also other less, there are other complexities in conventional combat that make apparent simplicity less than simple. Civilians perhaps taking shelter or attempting to flee the battlefield can be mistaken for combatants and have sometimes been shot or blown up. Enemy forces, of course, in conventional operations have sometimes used the other side's uniforms as a deception or ruse. But in the type of conflict that the Israeli Defence Forces recently fought in Gaza and in Lebanon, and that Britain and America have fought and continue to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan, these age-old confusions and complexities are made a hundred times more difficult and, more and worse by the fighting policies and techniques of the enemy. The insurgents that we've faced and that we still face in all of these conflicts are different. Hezbollah and Hamas over here, Al-Qaeda, Jaysh al-Mahdi and a range of other militant groups in Iraq, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban and a diversity of associated fighting groups, too, too numerous to mention, in Afghanistan. They're all different, but they're all linked. They're linked by the pernicious influence, support and sometimes the direction given by Iran. They're also linked by the international network of Islamist extremism. These groups, as well as others, have learnt and continue to learn from each other's successes and failures. Tactics tried and tested on IDF soldiers in Lebanon have also killed British soldiers in Helmand province and in Basra. Not just tactics, but also specific types of weapons and equipment. These groups that I've mentioned are trained and equipped for warfare fought from within the civilian population. Do these Islamist groups, these Islamist fighting groups, terrorists, insurgents, whatever you wish to call them, do they ignore the international laws of armed conflict? 
No, they don't. Instead, they study the laws and the rules carefully, and they understand them very well. They know that a British or an Israeli commander and his men are bound by international law and the rules of engagement that flow from it. They then do their utmost, their utmost to exploit what they view as one of their enemy's main weaknesses. These groups' very modus operandi is based on the correct assumption that Western armies will normally abide by the rules. It is not simply that these insurgents do not adhere to the laws of war, it is that they employ a deliberate policy of operating consistently outside international law. Their entire operational doctrine is founded on this basis. In Gaza, as in Basra, as in the towns and villages of southern Afghanistan, civilians and their property are routinely exploited by these groups. In deliberate and flagrant violation of any international laws or reasonable norms of civilized behavior for both tactical and strategic gain. Stripped of any moral considerations, this policy operates simply and effectively at both levels. On the tactical level, protected buildings, mosques, schools, hospitals are used as strongholds, allowing the enemy the protection not only of stone walls, but also of international law. On the strategic level, any mistake or in some cases legal and proportional response by a Western army will be deliberately exploited and manipulated in order to produce international outcry and condemnation. And in sophisticated groupings such as Hamas and Hezbollah, the media will be exploited also as a critical implement of their military strategy. Thus in April 2004, as coalition forces fought to wrest the Iraqi town of Fallujah from Al-Qaeda's control, the media reports screamed of a U.S. bombardment of a mosque. The reality of that day was that five U.S. Marines were wounded by fire from that mosque and that the Marine commander on the ground exercised great care and restraint, only allowing fire to be directed upon the outer wall of the building. Despite this, the damage had been done and the impression that we had leveled a mosque indiscriminately was firmly established. In Gaza, according to residents there, Hamas fighters who previously wore black or khaki uniforms discarded them when Operation Cast Lead began to blend in with the crowds and use them as human shields. We have of course seen all this before in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Today British soldiers patrolling in Helmand province will come under sustained rockets, machine gun and small arms fire from within a populated village or a network of farming complexes containing local men, women and children. The British troops will return fire with as much caution as they can. And rather than drop a 500 pound bomb onto the enemy from the air to avoid civilian casualties, they will often assault through the village, placing their own lives at greater risk. They might face booby traps or mines as they clear through. When they get into the village, there is no sign of the enemy. Instead, the very same people that were shooting at them 20 minutes ago, now unrecognized and changed in appearance, unrecognized by the soldiers, will be tilling the land, waving, smiling, and indeed talking cheerfully and engaging the soldiers in conversation. These same insurgents will mine roads used by British vehicles and tracks used by foot patrols. Many British soldiers have lost their legs or their lives in this kind of attack. There is, of course, no question of minefields being marked, as is explicitly required under international law. The idea would be preposterous, but although one of the clearest tenets of the laws of war, rarely, is, if ever, is this commented on by the media. Like Hamas in Gaza, the Taliban in southern Afghanistan are masters at shielding themselves behind the civilian population and then melting into the population for protection. Hamas, of course, deployed suicide attackers in Gaza, including women and children. In Iraq, Sunni insurgents deliberately recruited mentally ill children for use as suicide bombers. Women and children are trained and equipped to fight, collect intelligence and ferry arms and ammunition between battles. I've seen it firsthand in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Female suicide bombers are almost commonplace. The use of women to shield gunmen as they engage British forces is now deemed barely worthy of comment. It is so normal. Schools and houses are routinely booby-trapped. Snipers shelter in houses deliberately filled with women and children. Every man captured or killed is claimed as a taxi driver or a farmer. In Basra, the common plea from captives was that they were police officers. Unfortunately, more often than not, 
this particular claim proved to be true. They were, allowed, they were only involved in terrorist operations as far as their police shift patterns allowed. I make light of this, but the difficulties in fighting an enemy who legitimately own and use the uniforms, vehicles and weapons of a police force, established, funded and trained by us, are self-evident. The British and US armies have grappled with these problems and I hope that we're now finding some solutions. Solutions that allow us to treat those that oppose us according to the laws of war, while also defeating them on the battlefield. When an enemy flouts the laws of war, then we cannot shy away from hard decisions. I'd just like to quote briefly from US military counterinsurgency manual recently produced under the direction of General Petraeus, who most people here will undoubtedly have heard of, and using lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan. And this pretty much encapsulates the approach that we use as well as the approach used by the Americans. I quote from this, the General's um, handbook. The principle of proportionality requires that the anticipated loss of life and damage to property incidental to attacks, that is of course to non-combatants, must not be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage expected to be gained. Soldiers and Marines may not take any actions that might knowingly harm non-combatants. This does not mean that they cannot take risks that might put the populace in danger. In conventional operations, this restriction means that combatants cannot intend, intend to harm non-combatants, though proportionality permits them to act knowing that some non-combatants may be harmed. Now, under our equivalent of General Petraeus's doctrine, when necessary, British forces now attack protected locations after weighing up the risk that non-combatants might suffer. We respect international norms and the sanctity of holy places. But when our troops take fire from these locations or roadside bombs stored there are used to murder the innocent, we have no choice other than to act. British and American troops now routinely search mosques in Afghanistan and Iraq, and when necessary, we bring fire down onto these locations. This is not done or should not be done in a trigger-happy or careless manner, but rather in a proportionate way and always with the aim of minimizing wider suffering. Obviously, this kind of action is undesirable, but faced with the enemy that we do in reality face, there is no alternative. And General Petraeus' manual goes further than the strict requirements of the laws of war. I'll quote from it again briefly. The use of discriminating proportionate force as a mindset goes beyond the adherence to the rules of engagement. Proportionality and discrimination applied in counterinsurgency requires leaders to ensure that their units employ the right tools correctly with mature discernment, good judgment and moral resolve. This describes the use of restraint and focused violence as a positive tool in counterinsurgency, not just as a humanitarian and legal moderation. It recognises the importance of winning and maintaining the support of the local population and sometimes even the insurgent himself, bizarre though that might sound. Perhaps over and above the priority of winning a particular engagement. Ultimately, in counterinsurgency operations, the military commander must balance a series of often conflicting and very difficult judgments, in addition to the other pressures he faces on any battlefield. The balance is between firstly achieving the mission by engaging and killing the enemy, secondly, avoiding civilian casualties, and thirdly, what I've just mentioned, the effect on hearts and minds the support or otherwise of the civilian population. There is a fourth judgment as well, no less important. It's also overlooked in the media and human rights groups' frenzies to expose fault among military forces fighting in the toughest conditions. And the fourth consideration is preventing or minimizing casualties among your own soldiers. There will frequently be times when a military commander must make a snap judgment between the safety of his troops and that of other people. Human nature dictates that he will often choose his own men. And it's very hard as a military commander to see how it could be otherwise. There is more to it even than the commander's human nature and loyalty to his men. For soldiers to follow their commanders in combat at any level, but particularly at the point of battle, they must trust him. How many soldiers want to die, be blinded, burnt, or have their arms, legs, or faces blown off? No soldiers will trust or follow a commander who is profligate with his men's life. And let us not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that these calculations, judgments and decisions are not taken in an air-conditioned office 
or from the safety of a rearward military headquarters. The commander must weigh these things up in altogether different circumstances. As a commander, you are surrounded by your men, but you're totally alone. You have the military arsenal of your country, or perhaps an alliance like NATO at your disposal. But the most useful weapons in the kind of close combat I'm talking about are often the rifle and the bayonet. You have to kill the enemy, knowing that you will then need to shake hands and win the consent of the family in the compound that he is occupying. You haven't slept for two days. You're shattered. You're wet with sweat, and the chaos of battle reigns all about you. There are no computers. On your map with your pen, you must compute the locations and intentions of the enemy, your flanking forces, and your own troop positions. You must do this immediately because the commanding officer needs a situation report. Your company needs a briefing to orientate them, and your fire support team commander is about to bring in fast air, helicopters, mortars, and needs to know that the danger close fire mission he's about to call in is not going to kill your own men. You must assess the situation and give the go in seconds to secure the initiative. The only advantage for the commander of all this is that it makes you forget about the 80 pounds on your back, the water in the ditch that's up to your waist, and the sweat and dirt that streams constantly into your eyes. The battle manifests itself as a wall of noise that surrounds you, interspersed with the infantryman's most detested sound, incoming bullets cracking above to the side and below your head. Every soldier who's been in combat, whether it's in Gaza, Lebanon, Afghanistan or Iraq, can testify to the chaos and confusion of war. According to a well-known military adage, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. It is difficult enough to manoeuvre large numbers of troops and vehicles across treacherous and inhospitable terrain, sometimes by night, in dust storms, rain or searing heat, in armoured vehicles with limited external vision against near impossible timelines, and coordinating with neighbouring forces, ground attack aircraft, helicopters, artillery, engineers and logistic support. But the complexities and potential for confusion are hugely increased when the enemy is trying to prevent you from doing it by killing you and blowing up your vehicles and your equipment. Piled on top of all this are the limits of reconnaissance and the frequent inaccuracy or incompleteness of the intelligence picture, sometimes brought about by the enemy's own operational security, deception and disinformation, sometimes by lack of resources or inadequacy of collection systems. For every intelligence success, even in modern armies, there are a hundred intelligence failures. In close combat, even the most technologically sophisticated weapons, surveillance systems and communications devices can and frequently do fail, especially when you need them most. Messages are sometimes not transmitted, not received or garbled. Precision-guided munitions don't always hit the target they're supposed to. Sometimes don't explode when they should, when they shouldn't, or say explode when they should. Especially in close infantry combat, the concept of the precise surgical strike, so often referred to in the media, is more often pipe dream than practical reality. The close combat, urban or rural environment that often exists in Helmand, Gaza or Iraq can also serve to diminish the advantage of technology. Frequently putting high-tech British forces, for example, on an equal footing with the Taliban. Then there is perceptual distortion, common in combat situations, which can lead a commander or soldier to comprehend events in a way that is different to reality. The stresses and fears of battle, tiredness and the body's natural chemical reactions, including production of adrenaline, can lead to excluding or intensifying sounds, tunnel vision, temporary paralysis, events appearing to move faster or more slowly than they actually are, loss, reduction or distortion of memory and distracting thoughts. These affect different people in different ways and can add to the confusion and chaos of battle. Next, leaning on the threshold of his compound, smiling at you, dressed indistinguishably from the population. General Stanley McChrystal, the new US commander of forces in Afghanistan, has said that the reduction of unnecessary civilian casualties is one of his top priorities, and so it should be that is also a high priority for British commanders in Afghanistan. I've personally witnessed the efforts that American forces have been making for years in Iraq and Afghanistan to minimize civilian deaths. These have been impressive. But of course, they've not always worked in either of our armies. In some cases, because of the factors I've mentioned, imperfect intelligence, technological failure, poor communications, the fog of war. 
There's also another factor that we shouldn't forget. There will always be bad soldiers who deliberately or through incompetence go against orders. We've seen this in the British Army. We've seen it among Americans also in well-publicized cases in Iraq and elsewhere. I've spoken of the considerable British and American efforts to operate within the laws of war and to reduce unnecessary civilian casualties. But what of the Israeli Defence Forces? The IDF faced all the challenges that I've spoken about and more. Not only was Hamas's military capability deliberately positioned behind the human shield of the civilian population, not only did Hamas employ the range of insurgent tactics I talked through earlier, they also ordered, forced when necessary, men, women and children from their own population to stay put in places they knew were about to be attacked by the IDF. Fighting an enemy that is deliberately trying to sacrifice their own people, deliberately trying to lure you into killing their own innocent civilians, and Hamas, like Hezbollah, are also highly expert at driving the media agenda. They will always have people ready to give interviews condemning Israeli forces for war crimes. They're adept at staging and distorting incidents. Their people often have no option than to go along with the charades in front of the world's media that Hamas so frequently demand, on pain of death. What is the other challenge faced by the IDF that we British do not have to face to the same extent? It is the automatic Pavlovian presumption by many in the international media and international human rights groups that the IDF are in the wrong, that they are abusing human rights. So what did the IDF do in Gaza to meet their obligation to operate within the laws of war? When possible, the IDF gave at least four hours notice to civilians to leave targeted areas targeted for attack. Attack helicopter pilots tasked with destroying Hamas mobile weapons platforms had total, discre total discretion to abort a strike if there was too great a risk of civilian casualties in the area. Many missions that could have taken out Hamas military capability were cancelled because of this. During the conflict, the IDF allowed huge amounts of humanitarian aid into Gaza. This sort of task is regarded by most military tacticians as risky and dangerous at the best of times. To mount such operations, to deliver aid virtually into your enemy's hands, is to the military tactician normally quite unthinkable. But the IDF took on those risks. In the latter stages of cast-led, the IDF unilaterally announced a, three hour, a daily three-hour ceasefire. They dropped over 900,000 leaflets warning the population of impending attacks to allow them to leave designated areas. A complete air squadron was dedicated to this task alone. Leaflets also urged the people to phone in information to pinpoint Hamas fighters, vital intelligence that could save lives. The IDF phoned over 30,000 Palestinian households in Gaza, urging them in Arabic to leave homes where Hamas might have stashed weapons or be preparing to fight. Similar messages were passed in Arabic on Israeli radio broadcasts, warning the civilian population of forthcoming operations. Despite Israel's extraordinary measures, of course innocent, civilian lives, uh, of course innocent civilians were killed and wounded. That was due to the frictions of war that I've spoken about, and even more was an inevitable consequence of Hamas's way of fighting. By taking the actions that I've outlined and many other significant measures during Operation Cast Lead, the IDF did more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any other army in the history of warfare. But the IDF still did not win the war of opinions, especially in Europe. The lessons from this campaign apply to the British and American armies and to other Western forces just as much as they do to the IDF. We're in the era of information warfare. The kind of tactics used by Hamas and Hezbollah and by the Taliban and Jaysh al-Mahdi works well for them. As they see it, they have no other choice and they will continue to use these tactics. How do we counter them? We must not adopt the approach that because the enemy flout the laws of war, we will do so too, quite the reverse. We must be and remain whiter than white. Within the absolute requirements of operational security, and sometimes we may need to push back the boundaries of operational security as far as we can, we must also be open and transparent as we possibly can. There are three lines of attack. First, we must allow, encourage and facilitate the media to have every opportunity to report fairly and positively on us and on our activities. This requires positive and proactive, not defensive and reactive, engagement with the media. 
We should bring the media into our training. Let them get to know our units before battle. Bring them in whenever possible during combat. Perhaps embed them into combat units, as the British forces do, sometimes for protracted periods in Iraq and Afghanistan. Let them see our soldiers doing their job in as complete a way as we can. There are big risks in this, very big risks indeed, which are self-evident and do not need to be spelt out. But we, we must be brave enough to take those risks. The benefits are great. The insurgents, Hamas in particular, put a human face on war with spectacular success. We must do the same. We must let the soldiers in the field speak with sand on their boots and with a sweat and dirt covered human face. Second, we must show the media in a way they cannot misunderstand the abuses perpetrated by the enemy. Our own units must identify such enemy abuses and make statements about them backed up by the hardest available evidence. Every frontline unit must be trained and equipped to collect this intelligence, this information, in the same way as they are trained and equipped to collect intelligence on enemy operations. This is information war. Third, we must be proactive in preventing adverse media stories about our own units. I'm not talking here about distorting the facts. We must look ahead and identify potential problem areas, preferably before they arise. We must have what the British Labour Party used to call rapid rebuttal units. They should have the ability to establish the facts on the front line very, very quickly. Be absolutely sure of the facts. They are not 100% sure of the facts. They must say as much. Where real problems do occur, where our troops are in the wrong, if possible, we should say so as quickly as we can, driving the agenda, preempting the shrieks of the enemy, the media, or of the United Nations. This demands a culture of openness and honesty among commanders and soldiers at all levels so they are willing to admit their mistakes readily to their chain of command. For any of this to work, I repeat, our people must be whiter than white. This requires the best of training and the toughest, the toughest of discipline, and it is sometimes even harder among conscript troops and mobilised reservists. Here I am not just talking about serious abuses and breaches of the laws of war. I include smaller things, like graffitiing, trashing people's homes that have been taken over or are searched and cleared, problems that apply in every army, every Western army, like being as courteous as possible to civilians, maintaining control over soldiers who have just seen their best mates blown apart is far from easy, but it's vital. Where there is genuine concern over our own troops' conduct and actions, we must not hesitate to conduct inquiries and investigations, and if necessary, bring people to justice. As far as possible, these processes should also be open and transparent. But this involves, of course, yet another major complication, because we must not confuse mistakes made as a genuine consequence of the chaos and fog of war that I've described with deliberate defiance of rules of engagement and the laws of war. Mistakes are not war crimes. We must also know how to explain this. Most armies do some of these things already, but what we need really is a radical re-evaluation of the effort required to achieve the impact we need. This requires a mindset that is hard to find in most armies around the world. It requires extra resources and a shift in priorities, and it significantly complicates already highly complex military operations. It does not answer all of our problems by any means, but all the steps that I've mentioned are, in my view, essential to countering the strategies and tactics of the insurgents we are faced with today in Gaza, Afghanistan, Iraq and elsewhere. They're also, I believe, essential in defending our military policies and objectives and, most importantly, in defending our brave servicemen and women who are prepared to put their lives on the line to defend their country. Thank you.